Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our event featuring Jillian Tett speaking on her book, Anthrovision, A New Way to See in Business and Life. My name is Jim Kelly, Senior Lecturer in Finance at the Gabelli School and Director of the Gabelli Center for Global Security Analysis. It's my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the Gabelli School. The Gabelli School's Centennial Virtual Speaker Series began in 2020, 100 years marking 100 years of purpose-driven business education at Fordham. In the last year, the Gabelli Center for Global Security Analysis and our wonderful partners, the Museum of American Finance and the CFA Society of New York, have sponsored more than 50 events that have drawn more than 8,000 attendees. We are tremendously proud of this dynamic partnership and a full archive of our video content will be shared in the thank you mail you will receive. In just a moment, David Cowan, President and CEO of the Museum of American Finance, will give a full introduction to our speaker. Jillian will deliver a presentation for about 40 minutes, at which point we, we, he will address questions submitted through the question field that is located below the video player. Please feel free to sub submit questions at any point during our event. We will be addressing as many of them as possible during the session. I also want to share that all attendees of today's event will be receiving digital copies of Jillian's book with information coming to you following our event. Now, without further ado, I turn it over to David Cowan. Jim, thanks. Great to be back. Great to see you, all our friends at Fordham, and of course, the CFA. So why do we continue to get so many things wrong in business and in particularly finance? What's missing? Well, Jillian Tett can assist in answering these questions by bringing in anthropology with a term she's coined called anthrovision. It's been an interesting journey for Jillian from studying marriage rituals in Tajikistan some decades ago for her anthropology degree from Cambridge to today where she serves as the Financial Times US Chair of the Editorial Board and Editor-at-Large. She currently contributes weekly columns as well as being the founder of FT's Moral Money, which has won the Cebu Award for the best newsletter in both 2020 and 2021. Jillian has multiple books to her credit, including the New York Times 2009 bestseller, Fool's Gold. She is winner of Columnist of the Year from the British Press Awards, and then a personal Cebu Award for the best feature article. So it's time to learn from others, and this book is chock full of examples to make us think. For instance, why is a 2005 investment banking conference like a Tajik wedding? or how she sees Wall Street as living in a quote unquote, Bloomberg village. Jillian is one of the few who saw the 2008 credit crisis coming. And in 2007, she wrote multiple warnings in the FT and for that uh, was roundly ridiculed at Davos publicly. Uh, she has several core ideas to Anthrovision. And one is that listening is decisive. And so with that, Let's start listening to Jillian Tett. Well, thank you very much indeed for that wonderful introduction. And I will try and answer some of the questions you posed, like what on earth do investment banking conferences have in common with Tajik wedding rituals? But I was going to start off by saying that if anyone was listening to that um, introduction cold, they might think that the subtitle for my talk is how come I'm so weird? Because I have spent a quarter of a century, about more than a quarter of a century, working at the Financial Times, covering finance, economics, and business, talking to people who either run the world or aspire to run the world in terms of CEOs, um, big investors, central bank governors, techies, business school students like yourselves. Um, and the one thing I've learned through that long career, it does officially make me middle-aged, as my daughters keep telling me, the one thing I've learned in that long career is that the vast majority of people I speak to have absolutely no background in anthropology and are apt to look at it as a topic and a subject that is very, very weird and exotic. 
Um, to most people who are not anthropologists, anthropology sounds a bit like Indiana Jones for academics. In the sense, you have social scientists who are essentially paid to study the human condition and who have historically done that by going off and studying weird, wacky, seemingly exotic places. And I use the word exotic in um, quotation marks because everybody's exotic to someone else. But since most anthropologists used to be Westerners, they went off to places like Samoa, where Margaret Mead, that very famous anthropologist, went to. And then came back with lots of fantastically fun stories, colourful rituals, great pictures, documentaries, all of which made for fabulously interesting dinner party conversations, but did not seem very connected to business. But the essential message of my book, and what I'm going to try and persuade you of today, is that actually anthropology is one of the best kept secrets in the intellectual world. Because the same tools that you can look use to look at Samoa or Tajikistan or anywhere else are incredibly insightful when you use them to look at modern Western business, financial, policy making, or any other professional setting. Um, the reason is very simple. Humans are humans wherever you exist. And using ways to look at the cultural patterns that we ignore is a very, very powerful um, tool because the cultural patterns shape us enormously. And just as we've all learned in the last few years that it pays to use a bit of psychology in our everyday analysis and life and business. Um, many of you will have read Danny Kahneman's wonderful book, Thinking Fast and Slow. Um, just as it pays to use a bit of psychology to think about your biases that may be affecting you in ways you don't understand, it also pays to think about your cultural patterns and your social patterns that you inherit from the world around you because they also affect you enormously. And the essence of anthropology that I really want to communicate is that anthropologists basically go on a three-part journey. They believe in making the strange familiar, trying to immerse yourself into a worldview or a life or an environment that seems a bit alien so that you can do something that we all know in theory we should, but most of us don't, which is to try and periodically embrace a radically different point of view. Trying to think yourself into the mind of somebody who seems a bit alien or different. And that difference can be on the other side of the world in Samoa, or it can be just down the end of your road, or shock horror, talking to a group of people who may come from a different political party. And these days in America, that really is something which can often feel very alien. So anthropologists believe in immersing themselves in the lives and minds of the other to try and understand how people are different from you think and live, which is something we obviously need desperately these days because we live in a world that's globalized and tightly interconnected. And if you don't understand how people different from you live, you're gonna be forever shocked by unpleasant surprises. But secondly, anthropologists do that not just because they want to understand others, but because they know that the single best way to understand yourself is to jump out of your cozy environment and to look back with fresh eyes, to become a stranger in your own land. Or as the Chinese say in a wonderful proverb, because a fish can't see water, none of us can see the environment we inhabit, in, inherited from our surroundings, you need to jump out of your fishbowl, go swim with other fish, go swim with other water, to then look back and actually see the water around you that's affecting you. Or to use the anthropology speak, you need to learn how to not just make the strange familiar, but also the familiar strange. And you do that, and this is the third key point, so that you can start to see social silence. Social silence. Those are the assumptions that shape us that are so familiar or so embarrassing or so self-explanatory or so taboo that we just kind of don't talk about them. And the reason I stress that is because most of the tools we inherit to navigate the world with at business school, at universities, at an economics department, focus on social noise, the stuff that we notice and we talk about. Big data sets collect data on 
noise. And it's the silence that often matters enormously, if not more than the noise. So that's a big vision of anthropology. Um, <clears throat> but I'd like to try and explain to you how I've used it in my own career as a journalist in practical terms, this three-part journey, making the, f the strange familiar, the familiar strange, and then looking at social silence. And then talk about I think all of you could use it today as they're looking at issues, be that medical risk, be that crypto, be that financial issues, be that sustainability ESG issues. But perhaps we can put the slides up, um, first of all. And I want, I'm want i going to illustrate this three-part journey through my own life because almost by accident, it sort of illustrated what I'm trying to talk about. Um, let's get the first slide up. I started off doing anthropology in a very, oh, I'm doing it myself, I think, um, in a very, very classic way. There we go, great. This is me back in 1989, in the last two years of the Soviet Union. Yes, as I said, I am officially very old in the eyes of my daughters. And I was at Cambridge University, and I went off to do field work as an anthropologist in Soviet Tajikistan on the Afghan border. And one of the crucial things about anthropology is that anthropologists believe that to understand cultures and societies, you can't rely on top-down analysis from a distance, usually. Um, you can't just take the bird's eye view. You have to take the worm's eye view. And that means, essentially, going and walking, talking, eating, living among the people you're trying to study, and looking at their lives bottom up, in the sense of just basically going there and absorbing everything you see with as few preconceptions as possible about what is important. It's really about trying to be humble and think yourself into the minds of other people or be like a child in another environment. So in my case, I went to a high mountain Soviet Tajik village on the borders of Afghanistan. And as you can see, I lived in a Tajik um, house, uh, you know, wearing Tajik clothes, um, headscarf and all. This is me with the Tajiks I was living amongst. That's me up there on the top um, right hand corner, if you can see in blue and down there on the bottom right hand corner with part of the family, um, you know, essentially being a chameleon, if you like. Um, and I was studying Tajik wedding rituals, which might seem like a really weird, exotic, irrelevant thing to study. But the reason I looked at wedding rituals and wedding practices and wedding exchanges is because the symbols and the ceremonies and the traditions and the rituals echo a worldview of the Tajiks. And every time they're performed, they reinforce them. And in this case, I was looking at how the Tajiks reconciled being Muslim and communist, and whether or not there was a clash between these different identities at the time. Sounds abstract, but hang in there, because the point about rituals and ceremonies and belief systems um, matters enormously for modern finance, and I'll explain why in a moment. Well, in 1991, the Soviet Union broke up. Um, I originally got involved in human rights work, um, and then I became essentially a war reporter and through a series of accidents joined the Financial Times and went back to a world that in many ways was more familiar, which was London. And I was basically immersed in writing about finance and economics. And I then spent the next two, three decades of my life in a very different tribal setting, which is what might be called the Davos tribe. Um, didn't arrive there immediately. I was a junior reporter, but I then rose up the career ladder and ended up going along to Davos quite regularly, which is another gigantic tribal ritualistic um, event and ceremony. Um, you can see me on the left there. That's in Davos with people like Chelsea Clinton and Jamie Dimon um, up on the top right doing another great tribalistic ritual event, which is going on a television studio. Um, bottom right, doing a Zoom call with people like Jay Powell and Christine Lagarde and Yi Gang quite recently, and then doing another great tribalistic event or ritualistic event, which is called the Work Party. Um, that's here with Sheryl Sandberg at a Financial Times event in Silicon Valley a few years ago. Right, we can lose the slides now. Now, on one level, you might say, well, this leaves utterly disconnected to Tajikistan. And to be honest, when I was building my career in the you know, late 20th century, early 21st century, I often didn't tell people about my 
weird background because it seemed so weird and disconnected. And everyone I spoke to before the financial crisis tended to assume that, you know, if you were going to be credible as a financial journalist and you had a PhD, a doctorate, um, it must be in economics or business or astrophysics or something quantitative. Qualitative soft social sciences didn't really count for very much. But I've always used my anthropology um, to try and make sense of what I saw around me. You know, I used to joke it was almost my secret weapon. And I used to use it a lot to try and understand some of the hidden messages that were being um, presented or expressed and then reinforced through professional ritualistic events. Um, by way of example, in 2005, I took over at the FT a department called the Capital Markets Team. And I was kind of intrigued and curious about credit, credit derivatives. Um, probably most of you are too young to know much about this, but um, I volunteered to go down to a big investment banking conference down in the south of France to talk about credit, credit derivatives and securitization. And I remember it very clearly. I walked into that room um, on, I think it was Nice, and I walked in to these hundreds of bankers gathered together and I thought, wow, I'm back at a Tajik ritualistic wedding. And the reason is that investment banking conferences basically have the same function as a gigantic wedding ritual in Tajikistan in the Hindu Kush. Because what you're basically doing is pulling together a scattered tribe, enabling them to reinforce their social ties, but also enabling them to both engage in rituals that both reflect and reinforce a shared worldview with both social noise and social silence. Um, you know, obviously, investment bankers do that with PowerPoints and golf trips and bar crawls and things, not with Tajik ritualistic wedding. But the social function is the same. And if you use the same set of tools that I use to deconstruct and analyze Tajik wedding rituals, for an investment banking conference, you get a very, very interesting set of ideas. Um, in fact, doing that in 2005 is exactly what enabled me to foresee the financial crisis of 2008. Because when I looked in the halls of the investment banking conference, what I could see, first of all, was a group of bankers who had a very strong sense of their own elite identity. Um, and that was created partly because they all spoke a language which no one else understood, which wasn't Tajik, it was CDO speak or CDS speak, all the jargon. Um, they also were all members of this thing which I call the Bloomberg Village, which was this shared Bloomberg platform which you had membership of by virtue of having a Bloomberg logon. And that shaped how they all saw the, the world because they all got the same information off the Bloomberg Village um, screens. Um, and they had a set of ideas um, which, you know, was very persuasive in some ways. You know, they had a creation mythology, this tribe. And every single professional group, including journalists, has a creation mythology. Nothing odd about that. It's part of what defines groups and enables them to reproduce themselves over time. But, um, you know, creation mythologies are always ambiguous and always riddled with contradictions but people can't see if they are just insiders. And if you are an elite group who speak a language that no one else does, it's very hard for outsiders to look in. Um, and in this case, their creation mythology, you know, I jokingly called the, the cult of liquefaction. The belief that if only you could create perfectly free markets that were totally liquid, where everything could be traded with total liquefaction, life would be amazing. And CDS, credit derivatives and CDOs, were seen as being tools for perfect liquefaction, which sounded amazing, you know, and I think they half believed it. But there were contradictions, like the fact that they were creating these tools supposedly to create perfect free markets as part of a free market mark to market accounting system. But the CDOs were so complicated that they were barely traded. So to get prices, they couldn't go to the free market. They had to use models, which in retrospect was bonkers, but no one could see it. Or to give another example, 
Um, they kept saying this was being done to disperse risk and make the system safer. But the techniques they were using to disperse risk were so complicated, they were creating more opacity and more risk. Or they kept saying, we are doing all this innovation to serve customers and serve people, which sounded amazing. But on their PowerPoints, there were no pictures of faces at all. It was just Greek letters and charts. And you might say, well, that's not weird. That's what bankers always do. Bankers never put faces on their PowerPoints. But in some ways, that was quite a telling reflection of a mind view, whereby the financiers were looking at finance as this kind of abstract endeavor, which was detached from the real world in the sense they couldn't see the end results of what was happening um, and how that might be subverting their models. Um, there's this wonderful scene in the movie, The Big Short, based on Michael Lewis's book about the crisis, where hedge fund traders go down to Florida and meet a lap dancer who has subprime mortgages. And they're very shocked by what she's doing with them. And the thing that's shocking is not that they were shocked, but that so few financiers or central bank economists or rating agency model people were actually getting out of their ivory towers or their offices and going and meeting the people in the real world who were actually using their products. You know, that's because they were busy, frantically busy. They weren't being evil, they were being busy. Um, they were essentially, you know, in control of this language that no one else understood. So inevitably, there was this elitism, a bit like the priests in the medieval Catholic church who spoke Latin and no one else did. Um, and they had no challenge. They had no one else standing there saying, you're mad because no one else really knew what they were doing. So when I threw, put all those pieces together, I came back in 2005 and said, this looks kind of dangerous. It looks kind of cultish. It could well end in tears. And as you've heard, it turned out that I was correct. Um, took quite a long time to be correct, but I was correct. But the point about this story is not to say, well, you know, wasn't I clever because I got something right, um, because I've got many things wrong in life. The point about the story is really to say that stepping back and looking at any type of business activity as an insider outsider, using this anthropological analysis, asking what people are not talking about, about social silence, and what then as much as what they are talking about, you know, what are they not putting on PowerPoints? And why might that matter? This is a set of tools, it's a mindset that you can use in any field. And I know that because after I had been covering the financial crisis, I then moved to America and went to Silicon Valley in 2010, actually, as you've seen from the pictures with Sheryl Sandberg. And almost from the moment I arrived in Silicon Valley in 2010, 2011, I was hit by the incredible parallels to an anthropologist between what was happening in Silicon Valley and what I'd seen in Wall Street. You know, once again, you had a technocratic elite who had a sense of being set apart, who had a strong sense of their own tribal identity, who had a strong creation mythology, which was all about trying to save the world, or so they said, which they kind of half believed, you know? I mean, I'm not saying they were lying, they believed. We all believe things that are convenient. As Upton Sinclair said, it's very hard to get a job to un a man to understand if his job depends on not understanding. You know, we all live with kind of half truths so that it's kind of convenient for us not to challenge to kind of believe. And the techies were like that. And when I looked at that kind of combination of factors, I went, well, this is just like Wall Street. There will be a tech backlash. I didn't call it a tech clash then, but certainly in 2010, 2011, 2012, that was quite an unusual thing to be saying. And of course, it later played out. But you can use the same same you know mindset to make sense of so many other fields. I mean, almost every time a scandal erupts at a big company, it's because of this combination of factors. Not always, but often. Um, you can use this to make sense of politics. Um, I mean, um, in 2016, um, I was very struck by the degree to which the um, elite intellectuals, politicians, or the media um, <clears throat> basically um, were, I felt, misreading Donald Trump. And that's partly because Donald Trump was using a sort of set of ritualistic language and communication style that they just weren't familiar with. 
And the easiest way for me to understand that was because um, someone said to me um, who came from a very um, sort of um, you know, humble background said, you've got to go to a wrestling match to understand Donald Trump. Um, and I went there and I realized that Donald Trump had borrowed almost completely the style and the communication patterns and the ritualistic drama of the wrestling ring and taken it into the political field. So all of these kind of taglines of, you know, little Mark Rubio or Crooked Hillary, all of this manufactured drama and name calling um, was all directly borrowed from the pattern of wrestling. And many elite commentators didn't see that because they hadn't been to wrestling matches and they didn't know what they didn't know. But many people who like Donald Trump sort of almost instinctively recognized it, this kind of almost Pavlovian response. Um, and all of these things which people are trained to think about numbers and rational language and be in love with the Kool-Aid of their own education couldn't see, whereas an anthropologist could see actually, you know what, this is basically another form of communication and tribal behavior and ritualistic patterns, which, you know, is seen in any culture. Um, you know, or to give just two other examples, um, you know, if you want to try and understand what's happening in the cryptocurrency world today, and I can talk more about this later on if you want, you know, you can't hope to understand that just by looking in terms of classic financial analysis and numbers and models. You know, you have to understand the power of symbols to communicate and shape emotion. You know, Elon Musk's memes aren't just memes. They actually are laden with symbolic meaning, which anthropologists can understand. You have to understand the importance of social networks. You have to understand the really crucial issue of trust and the fact that, you know, anthropologists used to say there were two types of trust in the world. There's horizontal trust, peer to peer, and there's vertical trust, trust in institutions and authority figures. And anthropologists used to think that peer to peer only worked in small groups. And when they became big, you had horizontal trust in institutions. And then, of course, digital technology came along and created peer to peer trust on a massive scale or what anthropologists call distributed trust, which can glue groups together. And peer-to-peer -peer distributed trust is the essence of what drives Bitcoin, or has been in theory. That's been very, very corrupted recently, but that's a theory. Fiat currency, of course, is um, vertical trust. But you can't understand that just by using economic models. You have to look at social and cultural patterns too. Now, one way to look at all this is say, well, actually, what I'm really trying to argue is that in the late 20th century, you know, business schools, universities taught people to navigate the world by using these intellectual tools like models or balance sheets, which were incredibly useful, but have the flaw of being bounded. You know, they're only as good as the inputs you put into the model or the balance sheet or the big data set. And what you leave out is left out and you kind of ignore. So you ignore the kind of context of your model or your balance sheet or your big data set, which doesn't matter if the context is stable, but if the context is changing, if the culture around your economic model is changing, they just matter. And we've seen in the last few years that things that we used to leave out, like the environment, climate change, like social um, tensions, political upheaval, like medical risk, like gender dynamics, all of those issues that used to seem external or footnotes to your balance sheet or your model, you know, they started to really matter. Context really matters. And if you use your models or your balance sheets without a sense of context, you're a bit like somebody walking through a wood with a compass who has a brilliant compass and they walk through looking down at the face of the compass all the time and never looking up. And if you do that, you're going to walk into a tree, no matter how brilliant your compass is. You know, you don't want to throw your compass away ever, but you need to look up and around and think about the context. And in the same way, you don't want to throw away your economic models or your balance sheet, but you've got to look up and around and think about the context. So really what I'm trying to say is that anthropology is about providing that context, that check and balance, looking at the cultural patterns that drive the models we use. But another way to look at this, and this is really what I'll end, um, and I'm happy to take questions from anybody on any of these themes, 
another way to look at it is that anthropology is also about trying to take a stakeholder perspective, trying to embrace many of the core ideas driving ESG. Because <coughs> if you look at ESG beyond the acronym, what it's really about is saying, actually, there is life beyond the model. There is life beyond the narrowly defined Milton Friedman balance sheet. Um, value does not rest just in the numbers. You need to take a wider view. And you need to look at your supply chains. You need to look at employees. You need to look at all these things which traditionally people have ignored, but which we've learned in the last few years really matter. So whether you want to call it anthropology, whether you want to call it stakeholderism, whether you wanted to call it ESG, or whether you wanted to call it what I often use the word lateral vision instead of tunnel vision, I think we need it now. I think many of the ideas that can help you get a wider vision, lateral vision, can be seen in anthropology. And when a bit of anthropology is combined with law, with computer science, with medicine, with economics, or with business, you have a formidable combination. So I hope I've inspired you all to recognize that anthropology is not just um, Indiana Jones. Today, anthropologists are working in many, many modern Western business contexts. I write about them in my book, Intel, JP Morgan, Bank of England, um, you know, you name it, anthropologists are working there. They don't often advertise themselves because they're trained to be chameleons and hide in the bushes and observe others. But if you meet one, hug them, learn what you can, and even better, try to adopt some of their ideas. So thank you very much indeed, and happy to take questions on that or anything else linked to my day job at the FT. Um, I am still at the FT and I chair the editorial board there. So thank you. And thank you. And we'll give you a virtual hug from all the audience. Um, thank you. You don't want to hug me, actually, because I say, as we were chatting earlier, I've actually, I'm just, I've got COVID. So I'm just recovering, but you don't want to come anywhere near me right now. I hear you. So you, you definitely touched it. I just want to make sure we fully covered it. And thank you, of course. But um, because our audience is always so interested in crypto and in NFT and, you know, your thoughts here, your analysis, what might you be able to add even more? You did give us a bit of your perspective. I just want to make sure we fully covered that um, because it, it comes up every time we have an event. Absolutely. Well, I've got four or five key points to make. Point one, you can't hope to understand crypto just with economic models. You've got to look at social networks, at tribalism, at signaling devices, um, and at the wider question of what is value. You know, value is not something which is, you know, always easily re reduced to a um, spreadsheet, frankly. Um, and you also need to think about trust. What are you trusting? And the trust issue is fascinating because, you know, the second key point I'll make is that crypto, like any professional group, including journalists, let me stress, and anthropologists, crypto has a creation mythology. You know, in this case, the tablets of Moses were handed down by, you know, Satoshi Nakamoto's white paper. Um, <clears throat> And that formed the basis for a lot of the creation mythology around crypto. And like all creation mythologies, it is riddled with contradictions. And I wrote a column the other day, you know, outlining four or five of these key contradictions. Um, I won't go through all of them, but, you know, for example, people say crypto is innovative because of its created digital money. Uh, no, actually, we had digital money before. And mostly crypto is actually not about money. It's about value in a wider sense. Um, people say, and this is a really, really important thing, crypto is innovative because it's distributed and it's all about um, basically having distributed trust peer-to-peer -peer without authority figures. Well, yes, that is a dream and the aspiration and parts of the crypto world are like that. But newsflash, many parts of it today are anything but. There's a tremendous amount of re-centralization occurring um, furtively be that things like the creation of private chains, um, you know, JP Morgan's private chain, trust partly rests in JP Morgan. Um, <clears throat> the rise of CBDCs is a classic example. It's not crypto CBDCs, but, you know, blockchain technology using a ledger is where you're getting central banks essentially being anything but distributed. Um, 
to me, one of the most interesting issues right now, um, which gets zero attention, except for briefly this week in relation to um, BTX, is that um, the exchanges, by virtue of having both the ability to act the platform for trading and being essentially a broker, and by having custody, which everyone's ignored until recently, they are recentralization writ large. So there's all these areas where you're getting recentralization. And it's striking because I spoke to a number of the crypto um, sort of pioneers the other day, and they kind of all acknowledge this. I mean, Vitalik acknowledges this. Um, Joe Lubin acknowledges this. Um, they say it's the least bad way to get the dream actually pushed forward. And they keep saying, well, of course, the internet started out as a bunch of walled gardens, intranets, and they all linked up and, hey, it was fine. Maybe. You know, these are examples where you get this kind of um, contradiction between rhetoric and reality, which, again, anthropologists aren't surprised by, and they're not necessarily criticizing because we all have contradictions in our creation mythologies. But you need to recognize it if you're getting involved in the world of crypto. And the last point I make really strongly is this, that um, and I'm not anti-crypto at all. I'm not anti-blockchain or anti-blockchain ledger. I think there's a lot of potential there, um, but probably not as it's presented right now. But the last point I make is this really strongly, is that one of the things anthropologists say is that every single society and social group assumes that the way they live and breathe and operate and function is natural and inevitable and permanent. So because we've had fiat currency organized by central banks with an inflation mandate in the last three or four decades, you know, we, and by we, I mean journalists, all assume that's permanent. That's the only way to organize things. Now, of course, if you look back at history, you know, that's absolute baloney, or to use a wonderful English phrase, it's total bollocks. And that's what we often say at the FT, it's total bollocks. Um, but, um, you know, the reality is, you know, there are many ways to organize money. And perhaps the single biggest point that crypto enthusiasts should make is looking at anthropology. We know there are many ways to organize money. And just because we've had the one way we've had for the last 40 years does not mean it's destined to always remain in place at all. Get some more imagination. And that's what anthropology can teach you. Very good. Jillian, before I ask a question, can I ask the audience to please um, submit your questions now? We have a number coming in, but we could use certainly a few more. So please do that. Um, one question coming in from uh, Richard Eason. It says, it seems all human groups require often uncritical acceptance of some basic tenets from religions to free market theory to real politic. How do we break out of these binders this is always this this always puts us upon us. You can't. You can't. I mean, we all are, you know, our human brain in the same way that I you know, I wrote my last book, not the last book, the book before last was called The Silo Effect. And it basically said, guess what? Newsflash, we're all prone to silos because we're human. It's a bit like saying we all get angry because we're human. Um, you know, our brain can't cope with the amount of information it's dealing with on a daily basis, so we have to create ways to sort it. So we classify the information around us. And when those classification systems become rigid, we get silos and they can be really beneficial. They can really create accountability and get us to do stuff, or they can cause us to do absolutely insanely crazy things because they create tunnel vision and they create tribalism. Um, and in my book, I talk about both. But the point is you can't abolish silos. You can't stop our brains classifying things. It's part of being human. The critical question is, are you going to be mastered by your silos, the ones you inherit unthinkingly from your environment, or are you going to master them? Are you going to have the ability to think like an anthropologist and periodically jump out of your fishbowl, look back, look at your silos and ask, is the way I'm classifying the world sensible? Does it reflect the way the world is? Or am I doing some nutty things which causes stuff and ideas and information to fall between cracks? or causing different tribes in a company to fight each other stupidly. Um, in the same way, <clears throat> having a belief system, having a social network, having rituals that connect human beings. You know, yes, if we were basically AI-based robots, we could get rid of them. But guess what? We're human. And so we're always going to have them in some form. Um, even the most rational scientists in the world 
have these kind of seemingly irrational um, rituals. Um, part of my book, you know, has a vignette looking at the people who built the internet, um, who lived, you would think, in cyberspace. If anyone's going to live in cyberspace and be rational and disembodied, it'll be the people who built the internet. Um, and it turns out that they are, they are absolutely obsessively attached to these real world, you know, anachronistic rituals like humming. And when they come together to make decisions, they don't vote and they certainly don't do a cyber poll. Um, they all hum to indicate whether they agree with something or not. You know, it's a tr true story, true story. If you don't believe me, it's actually true. So we all have rituals, we all have belief systems. And the question really comes down to, are you going to do a regular check on balance in your own belief system to essentially make sure it's not causing you to do stuff that's even nuttier than usual? And most crucially, do you have the imagination to try and recognize that other people have a different set of assumptions and belief system to you and enough respect and humility to try and listen to them openly to see where your preconceptions about what's driving everyone else in the world could be totally, totally wrong. And that matters so much. You know, we all know it in theory, but I, I can't stress how difficult it is for people who are successful and who are busy to take that simple step. And if you don't, it costs you. I mean, whether you are in the case of the section of my book talking about Silicon Valley and about how tech companies realized that it was kind of dumb to do what they'd done traditionally and de design all their tech products according to what a 25 year old Silicon Valley bro might like when an awful lot of their consumers were sitting outside Silicon Valley in the rest of the world and weren't 25 year old men. Um, or to take a really, you know, current issue, you know, if more of the world's business leaders and investors had recognized how stupid they were to presume that Vladimir Putin was driven by the same economic logic that they, that drove them, they might not have poured so much money into Russia in recent years, because guess what? Vladimir Putin has been saying for almost a decade that he planned to do what he has done. He said it openly. It was in speeches. It was completely discounted or ignored by 99.9% .9 of Western business leaders because they saw Vladimir Putin hanging out with a bunch of oligarchs who were embedded in Western business circles who seemed to kind of speak the same language. And they just extrapolated that the economic logic that drove late 20th century Western professionals was kind of applying in Russia too. You know, the fact that Vladimir Putin kept giving these speeches was a classic area of social silence that everyone just kind of ignored. So this is my key point. You can't not have beliefs, but you need to think about your beliefs and think about others. Thanks. And that's good. You did cover a question which came up on Russia, Ukraine, and how you think about things. And if you want to add to that in a moment, but uh, the next question is from Professor Chatterjee, who thanks you, of course, for your book and presentation. And relatedly, he talks about uh, Robert Schiller has written on narrative economics. He wants your take on it. And how is it related to Anthropish? Yeah, well, um, basically, um, um, yeah, Robert's fantastic. And in fact, Robert told me, um, with great pride and excitement that he was going down that path. I went, yeah, you go for it. Fantastic. So please, because pre-2008, you know, economics was dominated by the cult of the model. Um, it was all about, you know, dynamic, stochastic, blah, 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 blah. Um, in 2008, there began to be quite a big shift. Now, it hasn't gone as far as I would like to see. But, you know, a number of economists said, you know what, there's more to the life than models. And these branches of economics, which had been previously really downplayed and had low status, like behavioral finance, um, began to really get embraced. And what Robert Schiller has done with narrative economics is part of that. So I'd say hooray, that's fantastic. Um, a lot more that needs to be done. But if any of you have not read narrative economics, please do, because I absolutely salute him. And that's a wonderful way to look at ways to look at the world with more imagination. Jillian, here's a question from Robert Lung. What are your thoughts and observations 
of the political tribes in the U.S. and China? <laughs> well, um, in both cases, tribalism matters enormously. And it's, you know, it's, it's the fact that people don't know what they don't know half the time is what explains the polarization and splits. Um, I won't spend a lot of time in China because I haven't been there for quite a long time. But I will just say in the U.S. right now, um, what you have is really two or three things going on. You have not just so much a political split, you have what I call an epistemological split, a split in epistemology, in the nature of knowledge. Um, anyone who's gone through a higher education in the US has spent years of their life being trained to think in rational linear ways or pretend, I stress pretend, to think that that's how they're thinking. Um, so the very fact of mastering an alphabet teaches you to go A, B, you know, you add up meaning by looking at letters and adding it up, you know, in one direction. Very different, I should say, from how you read a Chinese or Japanese character where you just see a picture and see an entire pattern instantly. And it has different implications for your brain um, reasoning and the way you process information. Um, but people who had been trained in the sort of Western elite um, educational system, you know, assume it's all about command of language and command of words. And if you have command of words, like if you have command of money, you have credibility and an innate God-given right to power. You know, we're pretty arrogant. And I say we because journalists and, you know, academics, insofar as I'm, you know, an academic anthropologist, you know, are absolutely guilty as charged in the center of this. Um, and one thing that we have been very slow to realize is actually um, a lot of people don't have that instinct or that training or that way of looking at the world. And once you begin to get away from value judgments, and anthropology is not about value judgments, it's basically about trying to understand people, you realize actually there are different ways of seeing and processing information. Um, you know, I never forget, I mean, I mentioned the um, Donald Trump example about the wrestling ring as one of that. But when that wonderful tag came out that, you know, um, journalists took Donald Trump um, literally but not seriously, and many voters did the reverse, you know, that captured the different modes of reading and different tribalism. Um, when I talked about the wrestling ring, again, that reflects it. Um, another ex example I give in my book is that, you know, when Donald Trump used the word bigly, um, in one of the debates, I was actually editing on the news desk in America at the time that night. And when he said bigly, I laughed. And all the journalists who are all kind of from the same elite educated tribe, we all laughed instinctively. And, you know, laughter is never neutral. You know, a joke always defines a tribe and it always plays off social silences that you don't want to acknowledge. And in this case, the tribe was a fact that people who knew how to say big laughed at people who didn't say big, who said bigly or big league, he later said. And we laughed because we never liked to say it, but we kind of looked down and were very arrogant towards people who didn't have our command of language. Um, boy, did it cost people like me. I mean, I actually did actually write pieces saying I thought Donald Trump would win in 2016, um, but I was the only person on the FT saying that. and. You know, I got many things wrong. And I should stress, by the way, just to say that I, I've got many things wrong, wrong in my life. Um, usually when I've forgotten to look at life as an anthropologist, I got Brexit totally wrong because I didn't use my anthropology. I resorted to my own media tribalism and being part of the global elite and projected my worldview on the British voters and assumed that, in my view, they wouldn't be so stupid, in my view, to vote for Brexit. Um, and boy, was I wrong. And that was a big slap in the face to me. And it's one reason why I then tried to look at life differently and rediscover anthropology with the 2016 Donald Trump vote. But, you know, that's my key point. Tribalism matters. It ain't going to disappear. It's actually been intensified by lockdowns, COVID lockdowns, because we've been locked down with people like us and we've gone online. And when we go online, we actually intensify our tribal allegiances. And so we need to basically recognize it and go back to the key point. Are we going to master our instinct to be tribal or let it master us? Thanks. Uh, Tom Herman wants to know, what is the future of print newspapers and magazines? <laughs> is that a nice way of saying, are you, am I still going to have a job in yeah. 10 years time? Who knows, maybe I'll have my baking ball out by then. Um, well, basically the FT these days is um, about 90% digital anyway. Um, we have flipped over dramatically. Um, I used to run the operations in, in America and be editor. 
I now run the editorial board, which is a kind of brains trust, if you like. Um, but um, when I was running the FT in America, we basically flipped from being, I think we were originally like 70% um, digital when I first came in, um, in 2010. So 70% um, print when I first came in 2010. And then we pretty quickly went to 70% digital. We're now 90% digital. And the revenue um, very quickly went from print advertising to subscription to now we get a lot of revenue from digital advertising. Nothing odd about that. Most of our peers are the same. I think we will keep on print because it's actually a luxury item. Um, it sort of gets its value, um, its luxury value by scarcity value and by being counterimposed to, to um, the fact we live our lives on screens. So in the same way that people stream most content and watch it on their phones when they want, where they want, blah, 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 but still go to the theatre because that's an experience and it's a valuable and luxurious and extremely expensive. Um, so to, I think, print will always have a place because there are some things you can only do with the crinkle that you can't do digitally. Um, and what you can do with paper that you can't do digitally is what I call the three C's. You can create a sense of completion. You finish something, which you never do digitally. So you finish, you read the paper and you throw it away. You know, you go online onto a website and there's like a bottomless pit. And that creates this constant sense of anxiety, which you can play to, to keep people hooked. But it also does bad things to you. So paper has completion. It has collision. You can scan a paper and collide with the unexpected and see things you didn't know you didn't know. Whereas most of digital architectures today are designed to take you down rabbit holes. So you don't even know what you don't know, which I think is de de deadly dangerous. And print gives you cachet in that, you know, one of the things that has sold the FT in the past is a salmon pink color is seen as being, you know, having cachet. It's been this being international, elite, blah, blah, blah. Um, and you can't, you, you don't have that online. So that makes it valuable. It's a different experience. Um, it, I don't think it will die, but it's not going to be dominant. Here's a question from Amy Stillman. Have you spotted a new Davos out there or a <laughs> gathering of tribes like this? I think of the past. <clears throat> oh, God. I'm about to go to Davos um, next week. Um, okay. you know, and I regard myself these days as an undercover anthropologist, stro strolling the tribe for Davos. And one day I'm going to write a big book about it, <clears> uh, preferably after, after I decide I want to go. Um, but um, the, yeah, I mean, Davos is a gigantic tribalistic ritualistic wedding, a ritual, just like Tajik weddings, exactly the same. Um, it, you know, is a very, you can deconstruct it symbolically, um, you know, to see the messages. Um, to me, the big shifts are that pre-2008, um, it was really a <coughs> gigantic, ritualistic, um, almost religious ceremony upholding the cult of what I call Davos Man, which was driven by the Holy Trinity, um, or the four strong Holy Trinity, a belief that free market capitalism, globalization, democracy, and to a degree innovation were self-evidently good. I used to, I used to, you know, joke that they should basically have, you know, the, the creed of Davos um, and make everyone chant it. But that was a kind of the joking belief system that everyone believed those elements were self-evidently good. And pre-2008, everyone believed that they would automatically keep spreading across the world. And just like before 2008, you had all the charts of credit derivatives that basically always went up forever or with crypto adoption and going up forever, you know. You know, the Davos creed was going up forever. You know, the world will become more democratic, more free market, more globalized, blah, blah, blah. And the story of 2009 onwards was basically all of those pillars of faith crumbled. You know, innovation was bad because of financial innovation had created CDOs. Um, globalization went in reverse, first with financial globalization and then others. Democracy has really gone into reverse recently. Um, and free market capitalism became a complete joke when you have central banks, you know, basically buying everything that moves in the markets. Um, never mind the new wave of wartime economies where suddenly everybody in all parts of the political spectrum thinks that industrial policy is a good idea. So 
the last few years it's been like going massively back into reverse and Davos was signaling a kind of you know holy shit moment what are we going to do now this year it's kind of really interesting because now it's gone hugely into ESG and sustainability and half of the events are about ESG um, which in my view is basically the Davos elite and all the one of the elite which presumably includes most of you watching this call um, waking up and realizing that all of these balance sheet models and balance sheets and tools and big data sets that I talked about earlier all these bounded intellectual tools are brilliant but bounded and limited and you have to look at what's beyond the model and the externalities and the footnotes matter enormously and that's what sustainability does it tells you about the footnotes and the externalities so this year it's all about the externalities and i kid not every other session is about inclusion environment um gender rights um you name it so um blockchain blockchain's about sustainability how can blockchain save climate um you know i i, I wouldn't sound too sarcastic but quantum computing is all about can it help help with climate change you know there you go but these things you know they're all part of this you know nature of being human we create networks we create rituals we create ways to reinforce our belief systems and define our group by our shared belief system um it's never static you know culture is never culture does not exist like tupperware boxes wh where you can basically have clear-cut sides and stack them up on each other you know like they're bounded you know this is indian culture american culture um it's not like that it's a river you know it's slow moving bits come in go out it's always changing no one ever wants to admit it's changing but it always is but it matters uh, jim solway wants to know and maybe this is more about the united states how do we return to the center ground society seems to be spinning around in an ever widening gyro i mean is there a reversion <laughs> you believe there was a center ground to begin with i mean well, there was never a center ground because this image of the wonderfully centrist, united, post-World War II America was founded, of course, on the fact, inconvenient truth, that you're basically ignoring um, non-white and often non-women, non-men in many of your conversations. So it's always been an illusion, um, but it's a convenient illusion. Um, you know, how do you create a more cohesive society? Critical question. Get out of the tribal groups, you know, force people to mix however you can. Um, you know, things like national service are a very useful way to create a sense of identity that goes beyond your tribal group. Um, think, teach kids about the danger of cyber, tri cyber tribes. Um, I cannot say it enough that, tr you know, cyberspace doesn't just replicate our tribal identities. It actually intensifies it because when we go in cyberspace, we customize our experience. And it's human nature to customize everything around me and me and my tribe and so you become more not less tribal um so find ways to teach kids about tribalism change the architecture of the internet to force people to collide with the unexpected and to talk across groups um and try to find ways to focus on common problem solving projects and defining politics by problems and projects not by parties, um, pre-existing parties, you know, and last but not least, recognize that we're going to have to talk about trade-offs because without talking about trade-offs, um, you can't get sensible policy. And it's very hard to do that if everyone's tribal and single issue. Jim, do you want to ask one more or, and then we'll I, close? I think, uh, I think we've okay. Okay. learned so much. I think it's time to say thank you. Okay. Oh, thank you. A Jillian, so on behalf of Fordham, the museum, and the CFA Village, we want to thank you for, for coming today. And that was a wonderful Q&A session. And to our audience uh, that was involved uh, watching Mary Childs, we have rescheduled that for a week from today, May 24th at noon. She was terrific. We're really excited to get that back. And our tech is working, as you can see that today. And if you didn't join, you have this opportunity uh, to hear another phenomenal event courtesy of Fordham, the CFA, and the Museum of American Finance. Thanks, everybody.